three, two, one. Okay. Oh. No worries. I'll go ahead and introduce you. <laughs> Hi, everyone, and welcome back to another session of Dental Shadowers. Today, we are joined by orthodontist Dr. Alyssa Sproul, who will be telling us more about what she does in her daily, day-to-day -day life. Dr. Hi. Sproul, the floor is yours. <laughs> oh, boy. Hi. Uh, my name is Dr. Alyssa Sproul. I am a practicing orthodontist in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I created a PowerPoint. Hopefully it's interesting. Um, so we'll see. So this is a picture of me actually in my office. Um, when I took this picture, we were only open for three months, which was January of last year. Um, exciting day. Actually, we shot like a online video commercial. It was very fun. So please follow us at a underscore list smiles. We really have a really fun page. It's just kind of about um, not the typical orthodontist type page where we talk a lot about teeth or anything like that. Um, we show teeth. It's mostly community and, you know, it's really about the patients more so than us. So. All right. um, so how I became an orthodontist, um, I went to school a lot. Uh, see, I did a bachelor's of science at Hampton University. Um, I, then I received my doctor of dental surgery at Meharry, Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. I decided to do a general practice residency um, just to make sure that I was sure orthodontics was for me. Um, because as you know, once you become a specialist, like you're in it to win it. And so I wanted to make sure because there's a lot of things in dentistry that I enjoyed. Um, I really loved oral surgery and I love endo too. So I did a general practice residency where I was able to do everything except orthodontics. And that's where I realized, um, I think I'm ready to apply. I think I'm ready to kind of live in my purpose and my passion. So I applied and I was so very, very lucky. Um, the following year, I actually attended University of Nevada, Las Vegas for my certificate in orthodontics and dental facial orthopedics, where I also retained a, um, excuse me, a master's of science. Uh, from, again, the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And I'm also um, a candidate for to become a, a board certified orthodontist. Um, and I uh, sit in that testing uh, July 2021. Um, some people don't know. So as a specialist, you don't have to necessarily be board certified. And I didn't really understand that until I became a specialist. Um, it's something that you can do. It's not something that you have to do. Um, in order to become an orthodontist, you have to attend a program. You have to graduate from that program. You also have to take step one of the American Board of Orthodontics. Um, but step two, where you actually become board certified, is the part that I'm doing in July. So uh, this is a picture of me when I graduated from dental school. I look so young and happy. <laughs> um, this is actually my class. We took this the very first week we started dental school. And then this is my class when we graduated. And that's me at graduation. Um, this is also my graduation from orthodontic residency. Again, I went to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. At the time, there was only four residents per class. Our class was very unique as we had someone older two people from the South, and we actually had somebody that was from Vegas. Um, we had three students that was a little bit older and one student that was a little bit younger. So it was actually a fun, fun, and we all still speak and when we go to meetings and things like that. So you build great relationships in dental school. I have some lifelong friends um, that I still communicate with, and especially in residency. And this is the world famous Dr. James Ma, who is our program director. He's very, very well known in the orthodontic community for his CBCT research, which is like 3D x-ray, and his research with that, among other things. And he's actually a really cool guy. But when you read about him, he's a little intimidating. <laughs> um, so why did I choose orthodontics? Um, a couple of reasons. Um, th top three reasons is this. Uh, I love working with young people. Um, it's the challenge for me, meaning like, let me see what I do, does it work? Which leads into theory versus reality. So in the field of orthodontics, um, especially dentistry itself, especially orthodontics, you'll read a lot about this is how you do it and this is, and this is why. But 
you tend to question the why, especially when you learn more and more about the field, especially orthodontics, because it's a lot of theory that you haven't really put to practice yet because it takes two years, two and a half years to finish an orthodontic case and residency is three years. So a lot of things that you put into theory, you don't get to see in reality. So um, the challenge and then seeing what I have done actually work in enhancing someone's smile, their personality, their confidence is, is what does it for me. Um, I received braces when I was in dental school and I wanted someone, to, I wanted to affect someone's life the way that it, it affected mine. And it increased my confidence. I wasn't as shy. I smiled all the time. And the main thing that I always love to hear is I love your smile, you know? And if people only knew that, you know, uh, 10 years ago, I hated my smile, you know? And, and although that orthodontist has retired, I'm sure he doesn't even realize how much of an impact that was for me. And I wanted that for others. I wanted to affect others. Uh, this is a TikTok of me and my patient because, again, I love working with young people. So, <laughs> um, so I do TikTok sometimes with some of my patients, and this is the one that she chose. I'm like, really? This is what we're going to do. So this is fine. Um, I'm not really a dancer, but I like to have fun. And if it's at the expense of people laughing at me, I'm OK with that because I like having fun. And I love what I do. So I love what I do, and I like having fun. And orthodontics is that for me. Oh, sorry. Wait. OK. So here's a, a video of my office. I saw that some people did show a little bit of their office. Um, so this is just my lobby, though. But I'm going to hit play so you guys can see it. Um, so my office is not a typical orthodontic office. I wanted an office that was very comfortable and inviting, make you feel like you're at home. So as you can see, we have end tables, we have couches and pillows. We have a TV on the other side that you can't see. We always have candles going. Uh, we just set a really, really comfortable, warm environment. And usually when we come to, to bring the patient out, we're talking to mom. She usually sleep on the couch because it's that comfortable of an environment, which is like my goal, my primary, primary goal. All right, so my advice for any future doctor is one, to make sure this is what you want to do. You have to make sure this is for you because it's not easy. Um, there's days you're gonna wanna quit. There's days that you're gonna just be like, I just don't even know what's going on today, you know? And it's normal. Um, what's not, what you don't wanna do is quit. You don't wanna give up. You have to make sure that this is your passion, that you're doing it for the right reasons. Some people get into dentistry because they don't get into medical school. Um, some people get into dentistry because of the money, excuse me. But I'll tell you this, the money and you really wanting to do something else is not going to help you succeed in dental school. Dental school is one of the hardest things I've ever done besides opening a practice. That, top dental school, actually. <laughs> um, it's rewarding, it's fun, but it's also a lot of hard work. And you want to make sure that it is what you want to do because financially, it's a lot. Um, mentally, it's a lot. And physically, it's a lot because you study a lot. Um, you have, at some point, you'll have lack of a social life. Um, you know, dentistry becomes it because you set a goal and you got to get out in four years and that's your goal. Um, another advice that I would like to give you guys is to learn every day. You, you don't want to go just thinking, you know, everything, stay humble because there's people who's been doing dentistry 40, 50, 60 years, and they still don't know everything. And experience is the name of the game in dentistry. So learn every day, take every day as an opportunity to grow and to learn and to increase not only your mental knowledge, but your hand knowledge, your hand skills. And so be humble, I will say, and I'm going to keep saying it because once you start feeling yourself, you're, you'll lose that. And then once you lose that, you'll stop learning and you stop growing. And if you're not growing, you won't be successful. Um, the last thing I would say, and this really plays into being in dental school and beyond, is to be kind, be genuine, and have integrity. Um, you want to be kind and genuine because one, 
it's not easy for everyone. Some things are going to come easy to you and some things are going to come easy to some of the people in your class. Um, you want to make sure that you're you're doing your part, you're paying it forward, and you don't have to help everyone, but be kind. You know, you see your classmate is struggling in biochemistry and you're pretty good at it. Maybe you can help them. Maybe they can sit and study with you. Don't take it as a, I don't want to help someone because dentistry is about helping people. We help people every day. Yes, we get paid to help, but we also do things um, pro bono. But being in the, in the health field, you're about service. And so you want to make sure that starts from dental school out because how you are as a person starts then. How you are as a future doctor starts then. So just make sure you have integrity. Make sure you're always doing the right thing and that you're a nice, kind, genuine person because that makes people comfortable as well when you have patients. When you open your office and you're like, I'm this great doctor, I have great hand skills, but patients don't want to come see me. And that be, could be because of your integrity or you're not coming off genuine and kind. And that starts from dental school, to be honest, or actually before dental school, but mainly in dental school. All right, so I actually created a case presentation um, as if we are already residents in orthodontic residency. Um, I did note that some people suggested going deeper into the who, what, when, where, why of what we're doing um, so that you could, guys can learn more of the who, what, when, where, why. So I actually presented a case presentation um, that I actually did in residency. Um, it's pretty, pretty, pretty in depth. I won't bore you guys too much but I will go into some of the terminologies and things like that and explain it along the way. All right. So uh, we have a 35 year old male, uh, African-American and his chief complaint, meaning the reason why he has come to see us today is I want my teeth fixed. So does he have any habits? Like does he suck his thumb? Does he chew on pencils? Do he chew on ice? Some people chewing bottle caps, unknown. Um, any previous medical history, that's also unknown. Um, when I took over this patient, um, I wasn't in charge of any of these things. And so in residency, you will inherit patients that have already been in treatment. And he was one of them. What I do know is he had poor oral hygiene. His motivation to be successful with his braces was kind of questionable. So here he is, um, frontal repose is basically a face from the front. In orthodontics, whenever we take pictures, we want a picture nice centered, where we see evenly. You see the ears evenly, you see the nose evenly, and you guys can't see, but you see his eyes evenly. Your goal is when you draw a line straight down, everything looks even unless something is asymmetric, meaning like his jaw could be going to one side or something like that. Um, so these are the things that we look for, and I look really quickly because we've been doing it a long time. Um, so this big long word here basically means he's normal. Um, some people have really long faces. Some people have really short faces and he's pretty normal. That's what that big old word. <laughs> Facial symmetry, nasal deviation, chin deviation. He's lip competent. Lip incompetent means like, um, uh, you ever seen a patient, they try to close their lips, but they're always like this all the time because they're straining the clothes or they're here a lot. And it's because of, of how their teeth are sitting or et cetera, et cetera. So this is him while he's smiling. Um, gingival display is how much of the gums we actually see. Our goal is to see where his lip falls with his teeth. Naturally, we would like the lip to fall lower. Um, we're looking at his midline of his teeth, meaning where his two front teeth meet, which you can see is obviously to the left. You can also see his two front teeth on the bottom is to the right. So he's pretty, pretty off center. And uh, what I really like is that you can see his teeth all the way to the back, which that's what that means when you see buccal corridor. It's the corner of the lip back here. Um, a lot of people, some, well, some people, when they smile, it looks very, very dark. Um, me personally, I like a very broad, full smile, kind of like this. <laughs> all right. So this is his profile from the side. Sorry, guys. I was trying to see. I'm trying to get y'all out the way. Okay, perfect. Side profile is very important. Um, studies show African Americans we have a much fuller face, um, especially a fuller profile. So this is pretty normal for African Americans. 
we're looking at his height of his face in, in, um, in relation to the height of his lower face in relation to the height of his upper face. Um, we're looking, it's called an E line when you draw a line from the nose to the chin. And we're looking at how his lips relate to that. Again, these measurements are gonna be off because it doesn't really relate to um, ethnicity norms. So here is his teeth from the inside. Um, usually, I don't know if anyone's ever had orthodontics. As you know, we took pictures of your face. We take pictures of your teeth. And we use those as beginning photos. We also take, sometimes we take photos while you're in treatment and we take photos at the end. One, so we can have a before and after because we do some great work. Two is that we can learn from what we did, what worked, what didn't work. Again, the challenge of it all. Um, and then three, for you guys to see how far you have come and us to see how far we have come together. So in his case, we've taken oh, a great, great, great picture um, at the top. As you can see, most of his crowding is right here in the front. What we're looking for is symmetry. Symmetry meaning that he looks the same left to right if you draw a line straight down. He's very symmetric here, but not so symmetric here. You'll see where it says crowding, uh, which is the rotations. We don't say crooked. In the field of dentistry, we say crowding. So that's what you see here. And you also see here. And I don't know if you guys actually noticed, but he's actually missing a tooth here. So when we say we have a Bolton's discrepancy in dentistry, you'll have names of things and you have no idea why. Most of the time it's uh, someone who has created or founded this term. And so they usually put their name on it. So some guy named Bolton, Dr. Bolton, came up with Bolton's uh, discrepancy, meaning like you have a two size relationship, uh, discrepancy, meaning like you might have large teeth on the top and small teeth on the bottom. How is that gonna affect your bite? Or you may be missing a tooth, like in his case, how is that gonna affect your bite? And so he came up with a lot of measurements, did a lot of studies and, and came up with a lot of hypotheses of what happened in those, those type of uh, situations. So here's his bite altogether. As you can see, he has what we call a crossbite. A crossbite is when your top teeth sits inside your bottom teeth. And he also has it here as well. Um, my theory is he probably lost some baby teeth early. And these shifted over, which kind of blocked out the space for these. And that's why those teeth came in the way they did. That's my theory on it. Um, I'm not sure if he lost a tooth or if he was actually missing a tooth. Um, it's, it's probably a couple ways that could have happened. I'm going to assume he probably had the tooth removed. Um, so again, this is talking about what's missing, uh, which is his lower front tooth. Also, he's missing his back teeth, second, his second year molars, 12 year molars, excuse me, he has second molars all the way back here. Also, we're talking about his midline. So as you can see, his lower midline is to the right, and mainly because he's missing that tooth and his top teeth is to the left because this is where all the crowding is. Usually where the crowding is, is where your midlines are gonna go. Now from the side, his bite is not too bad off. So when you see these numbers here, we're looking at overjet. Overjet is where the relationship between the front tooth to the bottom front tooth uh, horizontally. Overjet, excuse me, overbite is the relation of the front tooth on the top to the front tooth on the bottom vertically. Um, we're looking at his bite relationship to those three to four, five, six, seven different types of bites you can have. And he has what we call a class three where his bottom teeth is slightly more forward than his top teeth. Um, these are fillings, if anybody was questioning. And yes, this is calculus and plaque and things like that. All right, so here's his x-ray. Again, he's missing his, um, he's missing all his wisdom teeth actually as well, but he is missing his 12-year molars, which is his second molars on the lower. Usually a lot of times when you're missing your lower second molars, your upper second molars start erupting. So that's why you'll see this tooth hang a little bit lower than that tooth. And again, over here. Um, most of these are about bone, how the roots are, things like that. These are his sinuses here, and these are his condyles, which is how we talk. And then um, 
I was blessed to have a full set of x-rays on him so you can see if he had any cavities or anything like that. So in the field of orthodontics, we usually take two x-rays. One is a panoramic x-ray, which is an x-ray that goes all the way across what you just saw. We also take an x-ray called a lateral cephalometric x-ray, which is an x-ray from the side. And I showed you the profile of his face, but now we need to see a profile of his face his teeth and his bone and how they all three relate to each other. Um, again, some really, really smart people who did a lot, a lot of research have created a lot of different types of analysis, um, determining facial structure, what's normal, what's not normal, where it should be, where it shouldn't be. Some things are related to ethnic norms. Um, again, when it comes to African-Americans and Latinos, we're usually a, a little bit above the norms in some areas. So, um, you don't have to take the numbers as true all the time. Um, in his case, he's actually pretty, he's pretty symmetric. Again, his lower half of his face is longer. He is what we call, um, he has more of a high angle tendency, meaning there's two different types of people. There's people who grow flat, like my mouth is on, and there's people who grow at an angle like him. Usually people who grow at an angle like him, he's not bad off that actually at all. They have a higher tendency to have an open bite. Open bite is when you bite down and your teeth don't come together. Usually when we see that, we're like, Ooh. Those, are, those are tough cases. I love those kind of cases, but those are really tough cases. So these norm, these uh, measurements, um, to be honest, I couldn't tell you what analysis this was. Um, everybody kind of had their, their one. Some professors prefer this one, some prefer that one because it helps them diagnose cases more. Um, I think this was a, a pretty standard one that most people use is the one here. Um, anything in red is really, really above. Blue is, is okay and green is okay. So here is a full collage of everything I just showed you. So from these pictures, um, a lot of times in orthodontic residency, we usually will um, call on someone and well, in my school, we usually call on someone and we ask them, what would you do in this case? And they usually go over with us um, how they would treat this case. And that's how, um, as orthodontists, we learn to treat on the spot, to diagnose on the spot, and to come up with a plan on the spot. Um, most orthodontists diagnose while you're in the chair. Um, we're just, we're trained that way. Um, so in his case, you're going to see all, everything I listed as a problem. Of course, he has severe upper crowding. Um, he has some cross bites. He has a lot of crowding on the bottom. He's missing a tooth on the bottom. Transverse, which is side to side, he has those cross bites. His upper dental midline, his lower dental midline are very, very off, and that bothers me. So one of my big pet peeves is I like my top teeth to be centered with the face. The bottom teeth, sometimes that's hard to do, to get them both together. Um, and then also his bite on the side is a little bit off. Um, again, he has a high angle tendency, um, which is interesting because he has a really deep bite. Usually if you have a deep bite, you don't have a high angle tendency because your bite is so deep, it's, it's going to take a long time for it to get open. But in our case, that actually helped us. And of course, he is very facially proportional, nothing to outside the norm. So again, this is my diagnosis. This is what we usually do in orthodontic residency when we have case presentations. And then we also write down our objectives. Our objectives is to one, correct the over, you know, the underbite. We also want to correct the overjet and the overbite. We also want to correct the crowding, and we also want to correct his teeth relationship to each other. Um, so there's a, a couple of options we could do. This is his treatment plan of how we're going to fix his bite. Um, so in, I used to do this a lot is let me talk about my anchorage first. How am I going to do what I want to do? Can I do those things? So anchorage is literally like just like how you throw an anchor in a boat and the boat doesn't move. It's the same way. A lot of times at orthodontics, our anchorage is using molars. Usually um, our first molars are our second molars and they prevent teeth from moving. Um, in his case, he's pretty much fine. We're not extracting any teeth or doing anything that takes a major, major amount of movement to lose any of our anchorage or to mess up his bite or to get more overbite or overjet than we need. Um, this is just explaining my mechanics. Um, and you'll see on the next presentation, and I'll kind of go over that with you. But again, because he is missing a tooth on the bottom, 
his top teeth won't be centered. But our goal is to correct his overbite and his overjet as much as possible. So it'll happen if his top teeth will be centered and he'll have a tooth in the middle versus a line of two teeth on the side. So he'll have a tooth centered in the middle. All right, so this kind of goes into his treatment, like his treatment notes, because in um, in my residency, our, our most of our cases we had already started. And so we wanted to know the who, what, when, where, why, like how did the case go right and how did the case go wrong? So in my program, we did a lot of notes and we, we, we kind of, we played detective and figured out what happened, which is a great, great skill to have because in order for you to correct something, you have to know what happened and what's wrong. And sometimes you'll look and say, I can see what's wrong, but what caused that to look that way? And that's how you, you become a great orthodontist. All right. So this is him in 2009. And I don't, you guys remember, he had a really, really deep bite. Meaning when he bit down, he we could barely see his bottom teeth. And that's mostly because he lost the tooth on the bottom. So what we naturally do a lot of times is we put we call bite turbos on. Bite turbos are um, like little ramps. I call them bite ramps. I call them turbos. A lot of people have many different names in dentistry for the same. But what it does is it props his bite open. So now we have enough space to put brackets on the top and the bottom. In his case, because his bite was so deep, this also allows us sometimes to use rubber bands. I don't know if anybody had rubber bands before. Sometimes we'll prop your bite open and we'll use rubber bands to help level out your bite. Level is straightening and correcting the deep bite that we see. So uh, in his case, I remember he went missing for like two years. Uh, missing meaning like he didn't come for adjustments for like two years. But when he came, he... Wasn't too bad off. I started residency in 2011, so I finished him up. And again, as you can see, his profile is pretty much the same. But his smile looks amazing now because what we did was we leveled his bite. Not only was he in cross bite, but his top teeth were sitting very low. So when we corrected his bite, we brought his teeth out and we brought them up. So now when he smiles, he looks a lot younger because his lip line is falling right above his. Uh, gingival margins, which uh, for a young person, that's what you want to see. Um, he's not very gummy when he smiles, which is awesome as well. Um, his top teeth are nice and centered with his face. His bottom teeth, again, um, as you can see, it's a picture, it's a tooth in the middle because he's missing a tooth on the bottom. Um, his bite has corrected a lot. And I'm sure his goal for the very back where those um, 12 year molars are missing is to probably get implants because again as y'all you guys know I already talked about it when you're missing a tooth on the bottom and you have a tooth on the top these teeth are going to grow down until they touch something and that happens a lot in dentistry you'll see it where these teeth grow down to touch those teeth um, in his case I think I believe we made S6 retainers which kind of look like Invisalign they're clear retainer um those are great. How I would do it now is I probably would give him what we call fixed retainers, which is a bar that goes on the back of the teeth here and also down here. And I would do that because of how he started. My goal as an orthodontist is not only straighten your teeth, but to maintain it. And that's one of the hardest things. So you can get the teeth straight, but can I make it stay straight? That's the hard part. And so what we do is we put something on there to just try to prevent that. In his case, because of how much crowding he started with the top, with, um, excuse me, in the front teeth, that's something I would put on. And this is his final x-ray. One of the joys of orthodontics is we're always looking at the roots of our teeth to see what we did great and what we didn't do great. So um, in his case, he actually looks really, really good. Most of the teeth are straight up and down. I just see one tooth that maybe we could have straightened just a little bit and then here as well. But also that's also where he is missing a tooth. So that might have been a compensation that we did so we can make sure that space stays closed. So when you anchor teeth, it's, it's less likely for those teeth to want to space out because they're anchored in the bone. All right. I think I talked fast, but that was the end of my presentation. Um, I am open for any questions that you guys have. I am here, here, here. I hope you guys learned something, but this was a good case to, to, to see. No, definitely. It was really interesting. And his teeth are like perfectly straight now. It's crazy. Right? The magic. Like, yeah. Like, he went from like a four to a 10, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but thank you, Dr. Sproul. I actually do have a few questions for you. Um, 
I'll go ahead and ask them. So the first question is, what do you do when you feel like you want to quit? How do you pull yourself out of that mindset? Um, okay, so I'll be honest. In dental school, I never felt like quitting. I'm just naturally not a quitter. Um, I would do, um, what do you call those? I was, be very, I was actually very organized, which is so crazy for now. But I was actually very organized and I would do notes and I would um, do lists. And my list would say, okay, how can I get organized? So in Meharry Medical College, it was tough. We would do what we call block testing, where we would take all of our tests in the same day. That's our biochem, our anatomy, our physiology, et cetera. Whatever classes we were taking at the time, we would take them all on Monday. And that in itself is a beast. So what I would do is I would make lists and I'll say, okay, what class do I need to study more in? Which is always biochem and anatomy for me. So I would I would study my easier classes towards the end of the week because I knew I wasn't gonna be burned out. So for me, I just organize and just strategize. Um, and I actually did well on most, most tests because I, I did, I studied a lot um, my first year. Um, now, when we got to working on teeth and things like that, I did get frustrated because some things come naturally to people and some things don't. So if you're good with your hands, if you're good with putting things together, making jewelry, I don't know, makeup, your eye on things a little bit different because you have trained yourself to see those things. So if I saw someone doing something for the first time now, I can probably emulate it a lot better than I did when I was 22 because I wasn't into those things. And I wish I had, you know, um, had a hobby of the, those kind of sorts because it, it definitely helped people along a lot faster than I did. But I practice a lot. Um, I would practice all the time and I would buy extra teeth and practice because I wanted to get it down. And I'm like, the worst thing you always hear is, you know, she got straight A's, but her hand skills, you know, because in dentistry, your hands is everything. You can't do nothing without. So, um, um, so I practiced a lot and I worked on the things that I needed to work on. Now, in residency, it was very different because in dental school, you have more structure. You have this class and that class and this class. In residency, it's almost as if you're practicing as the doctor, except you're not really getting paid as the doctor. And so then you had to figure it out on your own, how to get these case presentations done, how to finish my research, how to look for a job, how to do all these things. But I kind of applied the same thing. Okay, let me get organized. Let me get strategized. And this is what I'm going to focus on. And then I'll put my focus on other things. Now, fast forward 12, 13 years, but I'm only 25. Um, <laughs> to opening a practice, this has been one of the hardest things I've ever had to do. Not because you can't do it, it's just so much to do all the time. And I try to get organized and I try to do all those things I just suggested to you guys and it always just, the day just goes like that because in dental school you have your structure of your classes. In residency you have school, you have your patients and you go home. But when you open a practice, it is you. You know, until you get the right team, until you're able to have that team. So a lot of it is you and so many things come up. You know, um, one of my practice philosophies, I'm always here for my patients. So they text 7 p.m. at night, I'm answering. And so that may pay a wrench in something else that I had planned. You know, um, I love it, though. I wouldn't trade it for the world, but it has been one of the hardest experience, but yet the most rewarding experience I have had in my life. Um, now... <laughs> I have had times where I'm like, you know what? <laughs> but I laugh. Um, sometimes I walk away. That's what you got to do. You got to walk away, close your book, go do it the next day. I used to do that sometimes, mainly because I was sleepy. But um, sometimes you just got to walk away and say, I will tackle this tomorrow. Because right now I'm not in the right headspace. I'm not in the right zone. And I know I can knock this out if I have those things in place. Definitely. That's great advice. Um, especially, yeah, for us yeah. pre-dentals who just like study all the time. It's like you study all the time, yes. but you have to walk <laughs> away and you have to have fun, guys. You have to, you have to, I know it's like scary and you're like, this is my goal. This is what I want to do, but you got to have, you got to be you and have some personality because everybody studies, everybody can learn if they have, if they're smart enough to, and intelligent enough to pick up what you're putting down. But who you are as a person is what you're going to get you in school. You have to remember that. So 
you still got to have some fun, guys, especially in college. This You only get that one because once you go to dental school, like, it's so many other things going on. Some people have families. Some people have kids. Some people are taking care of some of their families, um, not including wife and kids. And so there's really grown things going on in dental school. That's when you're becoming who you are as a, as a you know, a, a middle 20, middle 30 year old adult. And so you need to use that time to have some fun. Get, get, your, good, get your good grades and get to dental school, but still have some fun, guys, because it's, it's nothing like college. Definitely. Okay. The next question is, uh, did you always know you wanted to be a dentist? If not, what pushed you towards this field? Okay. So no, I am not the typical dentist where I knew or my dad or my mom and all my family. No, no one in my family is in dentistry. Um, no one in my family is a practicing, um, doctor in the sense, not PhD. Um, I have a lot of engineers, et cetera, in my family. Um, I want, I learned to become a, I wanted to become a dentist is one of my big sisters in college. She was a biology major, just like me. I was not sure what I was doing. I was heading into my senior year. I was between that, that hump of junior, senior year, I think April, May of the year. And I was like, what are you doing? You're about to graduate. What are you doing? And she said, I'm going to dental school. And I said, I never thought about dental school. It's like, yeah, she's like, go shadow a doctor, go shadow a dentist. Here, go shadow this guy, you know, see if you like it. I said, but I know nothing about dentistry. She was like, they'll teach you, you know. So I went and shadowed this doctor for a summer. And I was like, I think it's something I can do. I, I like um, fast pace. I like constant movement. I don't like desk type jobs sitting all day. And so I knew if, if I could get in, I think it'll be okay for me. Um, which it worked out well. Um, cause again, I don't like repetition. I like constant movement. I like challenges and dentistry is all those things. That's awesome. And now like this job, yeah, now you're here. Right. Awesome. And I tell her, she actually has a practice in Florida and I was like, you know, you're the reason why I went to dental school. And she's like, really? I tell you this all the time. I don't think she really believes me, but I never thought about being a dentist. I actually wanted to be a forensic scientist. And, um, and I mean, I could still do that. I could be a forensic board oncologist if I wanted to, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> There's always room for anything you want it's to do. Always yeah. It's always wrong. It's always wrong. Right. Okay. The next question is, how early do you suggest children who suck their thumbs seek intervention? And at what age do you suggest children seeing the orthodontist? Great question. So you want to stop that habit sooner rather than later. As soon as you see it, you want to stop it. There's so many different modalities you could use now. Um, on Amazon, you can purchase like this nail polish. It, it has a bad taste. You could do excuse me, positive reinforcement. You can steal orthodontists and we could place something in there to prevent them from putting their thumb up there. Um, technically, it depends on how long you, you're doing it and how, how long it has been in duration, meaning like how many years is the effect it's going to have. So if you do it at night, and everyone's different, it depends on your age when you start doing it, how often you're doing it, and for the time period that you're doing it for. And so some kids will suck their thumb and you won't see anything. Some kids will suck their thumb and you'll see a really big open bite, very narrow jaws. But I would say as soon as you see that habit between five and six years old and when it's really, really major time is when you need to see a orthodontist for it. Sometimes we just watch and we talk to you and see if you're going to grow. Some people grow out of it. Um, I suck my thumb. Some people grow out of it and some people need help from us. And that's what we're here for. Awesome. Okay. The next question is, and I'm so sorry if I butcher the name. I know you said oh, it, yeah. but, <laughs> but how is Meharry, your dental school, as a dental school? And would uh -huh. you recommend it? <laughs> First of all, yes. Um, Meharry was honestly one of the best experiences that I've had in my life. Um, what I, what, what made me chose Meharry out of other dental schools that I was accepted to was I liked that it had small class sizes. Um, so when I was there, I think my class size was like between 65 and 68 students. Um, I like that because that means I got more one-on-one -on -one attention. That means my professors knew who I was. They knew my name. I knew all my classmates. I knew who, who did good in this class or who didn't do good on that class. You know, we really knew each other um, because you become like a family. That don't mean you like everyone. That don't mean you love everyone. But we are together for four years every day. And so 
I wanted more of a hands-on experience, a smaller, a smaller knit family, and definitely what I got. Um, I feel like Meharry kind of prepared you for the real world because we didn't have assistants in our dental clinic. We were our assistant and our doctor. And so that taught you how to survive if it's just you in an office one day. And I mean, I'm, I still do it every day. And my assistant's like, doc, you know, I'm here. I'm like, I know, but sometimes it's faster for me to do it because I've been trained to, to be able to do those things without an assistant. Some, off, some schools do have assistants, which is great. I had never heard that before until I went to residency because we didn't have that, um, which again, prepared us for the real world. We did have a, um, a, a big variety of patients, old, young, so it also prepared us on how to talk to patients, how to deal with different cases. And, and I really enjoyed my experience. Okay, awesome. That's good to hear. Um, I know a lot of people might be applying the cycle, so it's always nice to hear more about schools. Yes. yes. <laughs> All right. The next question is, have you had patients who've had braces but come back because they don't take care of them? Oh, that's every day. Like, yeah every day. He is one of them. He went missing for two years. Um, we have patients that just fall off. They may even, and it's not even, sometimes it's a financial thing. Sometimes it's not. It's just a life thing. Either they moved away and they came back and they just didn't see it as a priority. I actually had a patient uh, call yesterday and she brought her son in and her son only had two brackets on his two front teeth. We haven't seen him since 2019. So, of course, we do everything we can. We call, we send messages, we send letters. Some offices will dismiss the patient. Um, and she came in and she said she didn't know that he had to come every month. So, uh, every, it, it's all different types of reasons why someone doesn't come. Um, I, I actually have patients who didn't come because it was time to get their braces off and they love their braces that much. So, um, definitely, definitely. And it is a tough conversation to have when someone is not taking care of them. So it's one thing if, if you go missing and then you look like this when you come in, you know, everything is still put together versus someone who just has really bad hygiene, really bad cavities everywhere. And I have to have those tough conversations. And actually, um, one of the clauses I have in my contract for my patients is if I feel as though this is causing more harm, I will take them off irregardless of the parent's feelings on it because the overall health of the teeth is most important, which is a tough conversation to have. But once you have it once or twice, you, you get good at it because the health of the teeth is what's most important. And I always tell my patients, I say, we can have straight teeth and then we have cavities or we have swollen gums or something like that. Then we, we straighten teeth for no reason. No, definitely. I agree on that. It's a lot more than just straightening for sure. It's a, it's an uphill battle, especially because um, the age group that most people get braces is between 10 and I'm going to say 16. And that's their tough years when they're learning who they are. They're learning about hygiene and those things. And so we're fighting that battle with them, boys and girls. For sure. Definitely. <laughs> Um, the next question is, would attending an orthodontist sooner have prevented such overcrowding? I'm guessing they're speaking about um, this case or just in general. Um, it, when he was younger, yeah, it definitely would have helped. And, it, and I believe as though your bone is softer when you're younger. That's just kind of a well-known fact. And so his teeth would straighten out sooner. And then also it's more likely for them to stay in the same position because they haven't been in that position so long. So if they sit here for 45 years and now you're coming in, they know this spot more than they know the new spot. And so they all have a higher tendency for those teeth to want to shift. But definitely, definitely, definitely. I, I really believe what probably happened is he had that tooth sitting right here. He probably asked the dentist to remove it and they did. I believe on the top, what probably happened is he lost some teeth early. These teeth came in behind and these teeth just started shifting over time. If he would have kept without orthodontics, these teeth would have shifted even more, which would have made it a lot, a lot harder for us to straighten out his teeth. So um, it may have been a financial thing. It may have been just a, a dental knowledge thing. Like, you know, um, it, most kid, most people don't, well, probably when he was younger, because this is like a, a 10 year old case. So he's probably like 55 ish now, right? So when um, 
20, 25, 30 years ago, state insurance wasn't paying for braces. And so that may have been a huge issue of why he didn't get the treatment that he needed. But uh, absolutely, the sooner the better. Now, it could be too soon. If you're eight or nine, let's wait for more permanent teeth to come in. But if you're 10, 11, 12, you have most of all your permanent teeth, absolutely. It's time. That's good to know, definitely. Um, the next question is, in the case of the patient, um, when he left for two years midway through treatment, how long did it set him back? Um, I think he had him on an additional year and a half. Let's see. I know he went missing. I think I might. Yep, he went missing from 10. So when I started is when he was there, when he came back. And I finished him in 2012. So he probably would have had him off in 2010. But he, lo he lost a year and a half. And so he gained a year and a half. So we ended up taking him off in 2012. But that's mostly because he came in and he still had all his brackets on. Like that's miraculous right there. Like that's amazing. And then he had good hygiene, like his brushing. I mean, these are stains from probably coffee or whatever, but overall his hygiene wasn't bad right there. It's not the hottest, but um, a lot of times someone goes missing that long, they'll have a lot of brackets off. Some of them might have teeth missing after that. They'll have a lot of, a lot of cavities, a lot of hygiene, which set you back a lot. But he basically just lost a year and a half because he went missing for a year and a half. Okay, um, next question is, how did you relieve stress during dental school? How did I relieve stress? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so I did a few things like, um, so at Meharry Medical College, our first year, we took boards our summer. So summer was stressful. Second year going into our junior year, we actually didn't have school the whole summer. So that was a time for us to live like college students again and do nothing. Um, junior year going into senior year is junior year and senior year at Meharry Medical College is very different because we're working on patients all day. So now you're setting your own pace and your own thing and you're organizing. And again, you're setting your schedule of how you're going to see your patients. And so um, what I found most stressful at that time was the patients showing up because you have to do those requirements to graduate. So that was the most stress. But I, I made sure I hustled, like I made sure my patients came in. You knew the ones that were great. You knew the ones that wasn't. Um, but once I got to junior senior year, that's when I was really kind of chilling a little bit. I, so your stress level just changed a lot. Changed a lot. Um, I like to sleep when I'm stressed, to be honest. I'm like, oh, I got to go take a nap. I got to. I gotta. <laughs> Me too, I'll definitely. I <laughs> book and I will go to sleep. Um, now I work out. Um, now I talk on the phone about last thing to do or opening an office or owning a business. Um, now I just have normal, normal time uh, is how I really stress. Normal things that everyone does. Working out's a good one. Though. For sure. Working out and then sleep is always the answer sleep to every is, problem. Is the best. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Okay, the next question is, if adults are seeking orthodontic treatment but have impacted wisdom teeth, do you suggest they remove them prior to receiving treatment? Um, that's a great question. So that's a very opinionated question. So for me, I'm going to say no. I do not feel as though your wisdom teeth have to be out before you get orthodontic. The reason why I say that is because I have my wisdom teeth out and I end up having to get braces twice. So long as you're wearing your retainers, you're doing what you need to do, things should stay in place. Um, some, some people do believe when you get your wisdom teeth out, it's going to cause your teeth to shift. There are articles about it. I just know from my personal uh, research on myself for two, two, two times of treatment that um, they'll shift regardless and they shift it again and I don't have any wisdom teeth. That's interesting. Okay. I've definitely it's heard interesting. some. Everyone's yeah have a different take on it but that's just my take is that um we could definitely get them out when you're done with treatment if it's bothering you i would say let's take them out if you have cavities let's take them out but overall everyone doesn't need them out if they're in a nice good position you're brushing them there's no cavities or anything like that you should be that's good to know interesting okay the next one is do you feel like you were prepared for the business aspect of running a practice i don't know why i butchered that word <laughs> 
So dental school doesn't teach you anything about opening a business. You will take a class on practice management. I think it's called practice management, but they don't really teach you the ins and outs because every practice is a little bit different. And there's so many different steps into running a business, opening a business. Um, it, it, it has, it's such a broad um, subject. Now you can definitely take business classes. I'm sure at some point that would help you. Do you need it? Not necessarily because, and this is my opinion, is because you still are going to have to go through those same experiences. And I was pretty blessed. Um, I worked at a practice in Cleveland, Ohio, and he had three to five offices. Three offices when I started. By the time I left, I think he had six or seven. And so how he had us, each associate was in their own office. And so I learned a lot about day-to-day things from that office. Now, the things I did not know, I'm, I'm one of those doctors. I just like to know how things work. Um, not necessarily because I want to stash it away and do it up for myself later, but I just like to know so I can understand the business aspect. Because when you understand the business aspect, the practice will be more successful, whether you're an associate or you're the owner or you're a partner. So I like to learn some of those aspects of how things are ran. And especially when... People look at you, so when you're the doctor, people look at you like you know everything about it, and you don't. And so I don't like feeling like I don't know anything about the subject. And so that's one of the reasons to how I learned certain things. But mostly everything I have learned about running a, a successful, whatever you call successful, me is having a patient show up. Um, <laughs> successful practice is by doing it. And there's always going to be mistakes and hiccups and things that do not work out. And you, learning how to fix those things is what creates that big, big um, bag of tricks that you have in order to run a successful practice. And that's how people open two and three and four and et cetera, et cetera. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. Um, The next question is, were you set on opening a practice after residency instead of just working as an associate? No, not at all. Actually, I thought maybe I would buy in and be a partner versus opening my own. And I used to say it in residency all the time. So my three classmates, they all said they were going to open a practice. One of them opened a practice right after graduation. Um, The other one opened, the other two opened within the year. I was the last one when I opened um, the end of 2019. Um, I never wanted to own my own practice. But once I started working in the office, And I learned more and it was just certain things that I wanted to implement that I was like, the way this practice is structured, I won't be able to implement those things here. And so once you start seeing things that you would do differently, it kind of gets the ball rolling in your head. Like, could I do this? You know, um, I wanted to open somewhere where everyone felt comfortable. Everyone was inviting a warm, comfortable place to seek dental care and That was my whole premise on opening our office. Um, Would I do it again? Yes, I would. I love it, Um, but it is a lot of work, but it's so rewarding in the end. For sure. Okay, thank you for sharing that. Um, The the next question um, is, what is a typical day in your life as an orthodontist? So (laughs) I laugh because I'm like, where where did I begin? Okay, so. I'm not the typical owner, meaning like my hands is in everything because it's my baby. A-list mouth is my baby. I don't have any kids. I have two dogs. You might hear them. Um, But A-list mouth is my baby, which means anytime, anyone who's a first time mother or you have a sibling that you treat as your own, that is A-list mouth for me. So if the phone is ringing and I see my receptionist can't get to the phone, I answer the phone. So for me, at A-List Mouth, I am everything. I am Wonder Woman in there, in my head, um, Superman. I am, I, I'm everybody because um, I want to make sure that everyone is receiving the same treatment, the same comfortable, inviting, caring, loving person every time they come in, every time they call. And so if that means that I have to stop and go answer the phone so I can make sure that my patient's being taken care of, that's what I do. Um, 
typically in my office right now, I am a new office. So we're seeing anywhere between 25 to 40 patients a day. Um, 40 is a great day for us. We're like, oh my gosh, because I've only been open for a year. And so to have that many patients per day is amazing. Um, amazing. Let me answer that. Really amazing. So um, <laughs> um, typically we're doing one to two bondings a day where we're putting braces on. That's always exciting. Um, I haven't had any patients yet where I'm taking them off. I think I have my first patient tomorrow uh, where I'm actually taking them off a patient that I started, which is great. Um, typically, I'm seeing anywhere between four to six new patients a day, which is great. That's a great day, guys. You guys probably don't know, but it's a great day uh, for a new office. Uh, usually an established orthodontic office, they're seeing anywhere between 70 to 100 patients a day probably 12 to 20 exams a day. I worked in an office where we saw 100 plus patients a day. So um, working there helped me get my speed up, help me diagnose cases faster, do things faster because you only have so much time because you have so many patients per day. Um, but typically we're seeing 25 to 40, like I said, about four to six new patients, one to two bonding. Um, we haven't taken any, any braces off yet, but um, we'll see some emergencies. Um, we don't do any cleanings or anything like that in my office either. It's always like very exciting to see your business take off. It so is. I'm really well, happy take off, you. but just grow. And you like sometimes yes. you're so in it, you don't realize it until someone says it. And my assistant that I have, one of my assistants has been there since March. So one of the things that I did that was different was I was my own assistant for the first four to six months I was open. Oh, wow. and so I had one staff member in me. And so all my patients were used to me all the time. And so when she came, it was different, but she saw it grow from where we had eight to 10 patients a day to where we are now, which is amazing. She's the one who says it like, doc, you remember this time last year? You know, so uh, it's interesting. Yeah, it's definitely exciting. I'm glad to hear that. Um, but that's all the questions we have today, Dr. Sproul. Thank you so much for joining us and for being here with us today. Absolutely. I hope you guys learned something. Um, again, follow my Instagram. If you guys have any questions or anything like that, I'm always here. You can DM, you can inbox me. I'm, I'm always here to help. I'm a pretty honest person. So, And if I don't know the answer, I'll tell you. Too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Dr. Sproul. If no, you want thank to show you. your... Uh -huh. I'm so sorry. If you wanted to show your Instagram handle so that way everyone could like follow you. Oh yeah, I had it <laughs> I know you new age kids, y'all probably would have had like a link. And I was like, do I know how to do that? And so I didn't do it. Oh, no <laughs> worries. We'll just plug it into the search. Good to go. <laughs> right. There's my okay. handle right here. This is my office. All right, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you guys follow uh, Dr. Sproul. Um, the handle is right there on the screen. Um, Dia has just posted the quiz on the YouTube live stream chat. You can also find it on our link tree and on um, our group meet. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Sproul, again. Thank you. You guys have a great night. <laughs>